What is up, football fans? But most importantly, Houston Roughnecks fans. Welcome to episode 30.2. That's right, the second episode of the week. This is going to be the preview episode for the week three game up against the Michigan Panthers, my brother's team. So this one just means a little bit more. Uh, we're going to go over a bunch of stuff. But first, you know, we got to roll that music. I'm in the big leagues. Tony don't miss me. Balling like Houston. Hey, feeling like Whitney. I need a bag, bro. Send it too quickly. All right. All right. Like I said, it's episode 30.2. Uh, we are just rolling through this season, but we're yet to find a win. I have a good feeling about this week, though. I really do think that this week, the Roughnecks are going to come out victorious and it's going to be a beautiful thing. Uh, we're all going to love it and we're going to have a really good victory Monday. But until then, let's start with our opponent. I'm going to talk about just a generic overview of the Michigan Panthers, you know, what they've been up to that. Then we'll get more into detail. We're going to talk about their strengths, specifically the things that they have been doing well in the first two games. Then we're going to talk about their weaknesses because we got to know how we can penetrate the armor and how we can take down the Northern Giant that is the Panthers coached by Mike Nolan. So we'll get into that. And then we're going to get into what I always do in a preview show, the keys to winning. What I believe the main points that if we do those keys, we will win the game. So we have a lot to go over. Uh, Anthony Ratliff Williams right there. You know, I think we just need to be consistent this week. So consistent that I didn't even change for this episode. I just wore my work shirt. Just keep the consistency. I worked well at work. I figured that it'd work well here. So consistency. Anthony Ratliff Williams, what is he? He's consistent. If you throw him the ball, he's going to catch it. Even if it's a bad throw, he's got one hand. He's going to catch it. You kick a ball off to him, he's going to recover it cleanly, and he's going to take it and put you in good field position every time. Anthony Ratliff Williams is consistency. So... That's just the vibe that I want to throw this week. We really need to be consistent. We can't have ups and downs. We got to just come in hot and keep the fire burning steady. So let's get into it. Our opponent, the Michigan Panthers. Right here, we got Marcus Sims. He's a very fast receiver. He had the 75-yard touchdown last week. So they're one and one. They won week one against the Battle Hawks in the biggest upset of week one. Nobody thought that the Battle Hawks could lose to anybody, but possibly the Defenders or the Stallions. And the Panthers shocked them. They absolutely shocked them. Their defense was stifling. It was week one. Take that with a grain of salt. But that was a very big win for them and Mike Nolan and the crew. And then they lost last week to the Stallions. So to beat the Battle Hawks, very good. To come in and lose to the Stallions, not great. But the Stallions are the consensus number one team. They fought them hard. They only lost by a touchdown. Uh, they honestly had a chance to come back and try and uh, tie it up at the end. They just it couldn't put it together. So they're a good team. They're somebody that you can't look past. You can't say, okay, we're going to win this one. Look to next week. They're not somebody that you can take lightly. You know, even though their offense hasn't gotten it together fully, they have shown that they can have explosive plays. So this is an opponent we have to take serious. We have to come in and say, we are going to beat the kiddies. We're going to put them down at home and we're going to make the Michigan fans hate us. So let's move on. What are their strengths? What do they do well? Well, they run well with Wes Hills, that man right there, number 31. He was the rushing yard leader last year in the USFL for the New Orleans Breakers. He was going head to head with Mark Thompson for the rushing touchdown leader. Mark obviously pulled away with that and won offensive player of the year. But this is a dude. He's just a workhorse that you can hand him the ball dang near every play. Uh, so he can take 60% of the snaps and run them down the middle and he's going to keep coming at you. He's one of those guys that beats down defenses and he's just, he's one of the better parts of their offense. When you talk about the inconsistency with quarterback, you talk about inconsistency. Some receivers are dropping balls, the offensive line, all that stuff. One thing that is going to be good is West Hills. Then another strength is going to be their linebackers. Their linebackers are solid. They have Frank Ginda, the reigning defensive player of the year from season two of the USFL. Uh, he had he's coming off of a season high 14 game or 14 tackle game. Frank Ginda is legit. Noah Dawkins, he's overshadowed by, by Frank Ginda, but I think he's a little bit faster. I think he's a little more explosive. He might miss a tackle here and there that Frank Ginda will not miss. But I think Noah Dawkins is another threat. So their linebackers are just good and they're coached well uh, under Mike Nolan and 
Runza. I cannot remember who their defensive coordinator is, but he's doing a fantastic job this year. And then their secondary. Their secondary really stepped up against the Stallions this week. Uh, they are a secondary that's very good. They got Adonis Alexander from the Breakers. You know, they got Keith Gibson from the Maulers. They have very good talent in the secondary. A lot of people don't look at them because they look at the Stallions. They look at the Defenders. Uh, they want to look at these other teams. For some reason in the offseason, people just weren't talking about the Panthers. And now, because they lost to the Stallions, people still don't want to talk about them. But the Panthers secondary is very good. And they showed it against the Stallions. The Stallions almost put that game away. Matt Corral threw an interception because Keith Gibson baited him, showed he had speed, and undercut a route in the back of the end zone. It was an impressive play. This is a team that, man, you really do have to play well. You have to play your best game in the receiving game to be able to catch balls consistently on them. Then the last thing is their big play potential. So the Panthers have shown constantly that they can be stopped. They're not super powerful on offense. They're not going to drive down on you every single time. They're going to have a lot of three and outs. But what they can do is they can score a 76-yard touchdown all of a sudden. They can throw the ball deep and Marcus Sims runs under it and completely outruns your secondary for a touchdown like he did against the Stallions. Uh, West Hills can suddenly have a 35 yard rip because they've just been running so much all day that now it's late in the second half and your defensive line is tired and West Hills is going to take advantage and bust through a hole and it's hard for your second and third levels to take him down or EJ Perry. EJ Perry looks shaky at best in the passing game, but if you're lazy with your contain, he can take the ball and he can basically run it all the way down the field on you at quarterback. So the big play potential is always there. Even if we are stopping them, even if we they've shown no life on offense, you cannot let your foot up off the gas pedal because they always have that potential for a big play. They have the talent. They just don't put it together all that often. So those are the four strengths that uh, I came up with. Those are the things I think we have to pay attention to the most. I think when they're looking at tape, these are the things that they're trying to make sure that they're keying and they're taking into account. Now, let's talk about their weaknesses. There's a good amount of them. Number one, it's their offensive line. They gave up seven sacks last week against the Stallions. We'll talk about that more, but that offensive line is Swiss cheese. EJ Perry is running for his life. You know, he is not accurate. That's the weakness number two. His accuracy looks bad a lot of the time, but that is also affected by the offensive line. He is taking a lot of hits. He does not have a lot of time. So those two kind of correlate. Failure to protect the ball. That is not necessarily the offensive line, man. EJ Perry throws some bad balls that get picked off. Their receivers sometimes struggle catching the ball and they tip it up. And then there's just a lot of fumbles. Uh, Danny Etling comes in, scrambles. And for a second, you're like, wow, maybe Danny's this, the, the answer. And Danny immediately fumbles the ball. So they just do not protect the ball that well. EJ Perry has thrown a number of interceptions. They fumbled a few times. We should be able to get at least two turnovers this week. I think two turnovers is very likely. It should be easy with this defense, but I think that should be this, the floor. The ceiling could go much higher, but I think the floor this week, we need at least two turnovers. And then finding the end zone. Uh, man, when your star player is the kicker, that's not awesome. Like I love Jake Bates. I love the fact that he is getting the national recognition for kicking 64 yarders, 65 yarders. It's really impressive. but when they stall so much that the kicker is becoming their all-star, that's bad for them. They have trouble getting into the end zone. Sometimes they do mount drives and they sputter out. They do not finish it. They don't finish strong. They're not able to punch it in. So those are their weaknesses. Now let's talk about the keys to beating them and taking advantage of those weaknesses. Number one, it's going to be attacking that O-line. Like I said, they gave up seven sacks last week. When you're looking at our defensive line, we have three sack leaders from the past two seasons of the USFL. Adam Rodriguez and Chris Odom were neck and neck going all season, season one. And then season two, Ron Heen Bingham was always up on that sack leader board. He was always second or third place. So we should be able to match that, if not be even better. Like, yeah, sure. The Stallions have Taco Charlton. They have Willie Yarbrough, whatever. We have the best defensive line. Keontae Shad, Toby Johnson, Olive Sagapolu. Dude, this defensive line is dumb, dude. It's so good. It doesn't make sense. So we should be able to absolutely eat EJ Perry. It should not even be 
It should be child's play, honestly. Getting in there, I predict at least nine. There you go. All right, number two, we need to contain the quarterback, whichever it is. Now, EJ Perry has been struggling. I would not be surprised to see if they come out and start Danny Etling. Why not? Uh, but I think EJ Perry will start. I do think we'll see some Etling. Either way, both quarterbacks are very mobile. We need to make sure that we are containing, whether that be with a spy, you know, keeping maybe JT Tyler, Gabriel Sewell, somebody just watching over the middle, kind of hovering over the quarterback, making sure that they're not able to break out. A lot of what happened last week was that EJ Perry would maneuver through the just Swiss cheese that was his offensive line. And they had Frank Ginda kind of mirroring him a lot. But what he would do is he would kind of bait Frank Ginda up into the line and then he would take off the other side. And that's how he was able to get a lot of his rushing yards from the quarterback position is he was able to use his offensive line to get a little bit of depth and take Frank Ginda out of the equation so that he could run free and then get into the second and third level. He's a very good runner. He is. He's smart. He played at Brown. He's an Ivy Leaguer. That's the number one thing that they're going to talk about on any of the broadcasts whenever EJ Perry takes the field. He's a, the Ivy Leaguer out of Brown. That's all they really talk about. But what they need to be talking about is his improvisational ability. EJ Perry is very good at making something out of nothing. So we need to contain him and make sure that if he's going to beat us, he's going to do it with his arm. Because honestly, I don't believe that he can. If we make him use his arm 95% of the time, he's not going to beat us. Number three, we need to stop West Hills early. West Hills is a battering ram. What they want to do, and you know that this is how their offense is built. They want to just, you know, get the ball out a little bit with EJ Perry, spread the field a little bit, and they want to run it with West Hills because eventually late in the second half, if they've run it, 20, 22 times with Wes Hills, your defense doesn't want to keep tackling a guy that big. You see it a lot of times when teams have big bruising running backs is that they're doing it in quantity. Darius Victor is notorious for it, that in the first half, his stats always look very mediocre because in the second half, he's been running into people so hard that they just don't want to do it anymore. So he's able to run people over, get through the line, more holes open up than there were, that is what they're going to try and do with West Hills. We need to shut them down. We need to stop them at the line of scrimmage early and make them start passing more so that in the second half, we aren't tired of tackling Wes. We're okay, and we can take Wes down. He could be the X factor. West Hills tore us up last year when we were the gamblers, and we have to get him early, and we have to stop him, chop down this big running tree. He's a big dude. All right, number four, the last thing that we need to do, and this is by far, the most important thing that has to happen this game. We cannot do the self-inflicted penalties. Ty Rogers, I love him. I think he's a great right tackle. But last week, he had two false starts on the drive that could have won us the game. You cannot do that. You cannot do these things. That is 20 seconds that we lost from penalty because there's a 10-second runoff for each one of those penalties when you don't have a timeout. We lost 20 seconds of our 48 seconds that we had to drive down the field because of those penalties. We cannot be doing that. We have to have discipline. We have to self-regulate ourselves and say, hey, we are not going to move early. We're going to watch the ball. We are going to make sure that if we're going to lose, it's because they beat us and we're not going to beat ourselves. So that is the biggest thing this week. Penalties cannot happen. We need to be like a military academy in our discipline. We have to keep things tight. We cannot mess up. That is the biggest thing. Like, I know a lot of people will want to talk about Curtis Johnson's game management. It's his second year being a head coach in professional football. You know, he's done uh, some college football head coaching, but that's a very different game. And this is a league that is still very new and has wonky rules. It's hard to do game management and it's hard to keep up with everything with that happening. CJ is getting better. He's getting into the groove. Our team already looked a lot better from week one to week two. And I think this week, the Panthers are the perfect team to go and stomp on their home stadium to then come back week four at home in Houston and start the winnings. Just keep, keep them going. You know, we beat the Panthers, move on week four. I believe we play the Renegades, then we can beat them and that will just get the snowball rolling. It's, it's an effect, right? It's a compound effect. You want to win games because then you start winning more games. You get into the winning mentality. And that's how you get to the playoffs. It starts this week. 
This is a make or break game. If we lose to the Michigan Panthers, this is gonna, it's going to be a tough episode next week. It's going to be tough to come in and stay as positive as, as I try to be. But I'm your positive guy. I always have been and I always will be. We're going to win this week. It's going to be in great, momentous fashion. And I cannot wait to see you guys tweeting at me that I was right. But until then, drill, baby, drill, rough them up. I'll see y'all next week. I'm in the big leagues. Told them don't miss me. Balling like Houston. Hey, feeling like Whitney. I need a... Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the UFM United Football Media. If you like that, please make sure to like and subscribe. Also, if you want more videos, you can check them out on our channel over here. The best one for you is right here. And then if you like mine, the rest of my playlist is right here. Thank you guys, and I hope to see you next time.